Hello, Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of TheHappyMD.com in beautiful Seattle, Washington. Welcome to the latest episode of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. Tools so you can recognize and prevent your own burnout. Stories of burnout put to its highest and best use and wellness leadership strategies. Everything you need to be a physician on purpose. Hello, this is Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of The Happy MD in beautiful Seattle, Washington with the latest edition of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. And I'm super excited because we have Steve Moberg, the COO of Team Care Medicine with us here today. And what we're going to discuss is the fact that burnout's optional. Burnout doesn't have to be associated with your practice. Because what I'm trying to show in a number of our episodes here lately is that there are structural components of the modern high volume industrial practice of medicine that just don't have to be there that cause a lot of the struggle that ends up in burnout, especially when it comes from digital overload, digital overload from EHR, from inbox, from, from pajama time, charts at home, and all that kind of stuff. And Steve, just let me take a second to set this up. EMR was implemented in a digital environment that is unfamiliar to a lot of doctors at the time it was launched. And EMR essentially doubled the workload in the back office for an ordinary primary care outpatient practice. But what didn't happen is there were not hands on deck enough to handle the increased workload. So what ends up happening is it doubles your documentation requirements and the work to get the charts done, but there's no extra people there to help you with that. And so the burden fell onto the doctors and it resulted in the digital overload, the two to one minutes, two, two, day, two minutes in the chart for every minute that you're facing a patient, pajama time doing charts after work at night. And what solidified this was the MGMA, the Medical Group Management Association, has a survey they do every year on staffing quantities. And they call it a best practice. But what it does is it simply is an average of the amount of staff people put in the back office. And I just want to note that the staffing ratios that you see coming from the MGMA today are a key component of why burnout is at 50%. So Steve, Tell us a little bit about Team Care Medicine. These folks are the GOAT, the greatest of all time, the original folks in the niche for a practice transformation office team-based intervention that prevents burnout. Tell us a little bit about how y'all got started and what your program involves. Well, thank you, Dyke. I really appreciate the opportunity and hopefully we'll make this informative for the listeners. Uh, there wouldn't be a team care medicine without Dr. Peter Anderson. Uh, Peter sadly passed away in 2018, uh, but as you mentioned, he was really the pioneer. He was on the bleeding edge of the EHR implementation into the uh, practices. And you know, Peter's story started in the late 90s. Uh, he was 20 years into his practice at that point. Uh, he was a very happy doctor, had a vibrant practice. He was seeing 35 patients a day, able to go home at night uh, with, you know, without work to do and able to have a life outside of medicine. And um, he had sold his practice to a hospital system in the mid 90s. And they came to him, I think it was 98, 99, and asked him, you know, Peter, would you be willing to, we got this new electronic health record, uh, would you be willing to, you know, get on it? and uh, not knowing what was to come, uh, he <laughs> said, yeah, sure, I'll give it a try. And uh, so he, they put him on the EHR. And boy, you know, he, he used to refer to the EHR as the sharpest two-edged sword in medicine. And, uh, you know, you can't practice good medicine today without it because there's just too many data points for patients. But uh, if you don't handle it right and deal with it, it's a bully and it'll beat you up and take your lunch money every single day. And sadly, that's what's happening around the country now still, but way back in 1999, 2000, 2001, that's what happened to Peter. He, was, he wasn't computer savvy. He didn't know how to type, it, and it was a disaster. And within three or four short years, 
his vibrant, happy practice turned into really a mess. And uh, he referred to, you know, in our early days, he had slides and he, he showed this huge shipwreck, you know, this ship on a rusted old hulk on a, on a rocky bank. And, and that's really the way he described his practice. He hated medicine at the time. And again, this was uh, four years after going on the EHR. And uh, his practice, his volume went down from 35 patients a day to 16, 17, 18 a day. Uh, but he was working 60 or 70 hours a week in order to just process those patients. And so uh, he, you know, he was miserable. And um, the worst thing about it was he had no life outside of medicine. He was a ghost to his wife and his family. He had kids at home, young kids at home. And he was constantly looking for a computer where he could try to catch up and stay caught up. And he was up late, up early. It's the same story we're hearing all around the country still today. And anyway, he was, he didn't want to change right. careers, but he knew he could not continue doing things the way he was doing. And he was, he was always jealous of the help that a surgeon got inside the operating room with the help of an OR nurse. And so that's what he endeavored to emulate. And you know, he got with his clinical assistant staff and they were willing to work with him and help him because they knew how burned out he was and how frustrated he was and, and the patients weren't happy and everything. And so he started training them to help him inside the exam room. And uh, that was to help him process the patient visit. And he was gonna teach them four skills uh, that would really help him. One was to collect all the patient's preliminary information you know, about why they were here today and, and just get an update on everything about them. Uh, and then he was gonna teach them how to present that patient to him, uh, just like a resident presents a patient to their, or a med student presents a patient to an attending physician, same concept there. And then he was gonna have them, the third thing was he would teach them how to scribe the entire visit in the EHR. And then the last one was he would teach them how to do uh, patient education, go over the plan again with the patient and then close the visit so he could get out of the, you know, get out of the exam room. And, you know, it took him a while, a year and a half or two maybe of meeting weekly and, and going over what was working and making adjustments and here and there. But ultimately it worked so far beyond his expectations. Uh, he was just thrilled with it. And probably by, I think we're around 2005 now, 2006, he was back up to seeing 35 patients a day. He could go home at night with his charts complete and had a life outside of medicine again. Uh, he became the number one revenue producing doctor in the, in the entire hospital system or primary care doctor in the system. You know, he, he basically got his life back and some. And so he, he started uh, doing some speaking about it, he wanted to tell others about it. He wrote a book, actually a handbook called Liberating the Family Physician. And uh, he started doing some local speaking. Uh, he was on a speaking circuit for Merck. And um, one of the, the funniest thing was, he, his word started getting out, he had people actually flying in to see his office in operation. That was, that was incredible. And one of the things, one of the people that came in to see him was uh, someone from the Army, the U.S. Army. And they were, they were just beginning an initiative to take some of their on-base clinics and move them out into the community uh, where they would be closer to, you know, the families and so forth. And uh, so we got, uh, or he got an Army contract at that time to launch or implement his process or his, you know, the team care model in uh, these army clinics. It was 21 bases around the US and about maybe five to seven clinics at each base. And so for the next year and a half, we, we executed on that. That's when I joined Peter. He went from full-time to part-time and we began training doctors and launching this program with the US Army. And uh, since then though, in 2012 forward, Peter stopped full or part-time practice probably around 2012. And then since then, we've been training doctors all around the U.S. in how to get this model going and running. But it is, it's a very logical, very sensible model that uh, it is, it does require staffing that's above the AMGA, you know, recommendation or what have you. But 
you can so easily pay for an additional staff member. Usually it takes just a couple of extra ver urgent visits a day to pay for an additional staff person, a clinical assistant, an MA, if you will. Um, so it's easily implementable. And uh, that's how we got started was, you know, Peter, he was on the bleeding edge, literally almost of, uh, of implementing the EHR in, into these practices around the country. So Dr. Dr. Anderson had recognized the imbalance that his workload had doubled and asked for a team-based strategy to address that, trained up his own staff in four pieces of the job, which is gather the data, present the patient, scribe the visit, and uh, uh, close the visit. Mm -hmm. um, and then by 2006, he was actually teaching other people the technique. I want to remind everybody, as of the date of recording this uh, podcast, that was 16 years ago. And let's just go back to some of the literature, too. And by the way, I'm talking with Steve Moberg, COO of TeamCareMedicine.com. TeamCareMedicine.com. All one word, no dots, no dashes. Uh, let's just go back to the literature, because there is literature about cost effectiveness of a scribe in a family practice outpatient clinic. And the literature shows that if you can see as little as two extra patients with a scribe on board, you can pay for the scribe and the scribe is revenue neutral. But you said that a person on paper charts, Dr. Anderson on paper charts was seeing 35 a day, no problem. On an EMR without assistance and without being a digital native, he was down into the teens again and was back up into the 30s with no stress and no problem with his team-based intervention in the back office. Now, just real quick, I'm certain you were actually more than revenue neutral with that volume of patients coming through the practice. You're probably making more money than he ever did. And then my question is, for one physician in your system, for one physician, how many people do they have working with them in the back office on average? Yeah, he actually, Peter tripled his revenue uh, when he went to this model. So it, uh, but in order to really execute the team care medicine model and be able to use that process on every patient that you see during the day, you really need two and a half clinical assistants. You know, uh, two of them are devoted mostly to the physician throughout the day. They're helping them in the exam room, execute the patient visits. The other half resource is really there to help with all the ancillary work that comes along with every patient visit. Right. Whether it's referrals, lab checks, calling patients back who had questions, et cetera. That work continues to pile up. And if we took the two clinical assistants and just devoted them to the physician without that help for the ancillary work, then we're just going to burn that staff out. Uh, so you, you need two and a half clinical assistants to be able to do it all the time. You know, it is, it's pretty easy to pay for it. Cause like I said, a minute ago, it only takes a couple of urgent visits a day. And we make doctors, uh, when they go through our training and implement our program, we usually are making them anywhere from 20 to 40% more productive. And that's both in daily visit volumes as well as work RVUs. So when you're, when you're increasing volume by that amount and at the same time giving them their personal life back by reducing their after hours work, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, very adaptable. It's it huge. Works really well. It's yeah. huge. And I want, I want uh, if you're listening, I want you to notice that this is 16 years ago and still so many people inside industrial medical practices get nothing but stonewalled when they ask to up upstaff the back office because of the standard manager's complaint since you know personnel and benefit and payment packages are the number one expense on the profit and loss statement that it's like pulling teeth to get them to upstaff just real quick these two and a half people in the back office are are they specific are they nurses are they ma's who are these folks most of the i, I guess around the country when we go into a, and do a, an engagement most of the providers that we see already have one. It's usually a one-to-one -one or maybe 1 1.5 to one clinical assistance per provider. Um, so, you know, generally we're getting them to hire an additional person. Usually it's an MA, probably 85% of the time we're just asking them to hire a new MA 
Um, Somebody you can you, type. Yep, yep. And someone who enjoys patient uh, involvement, you know, they, they get to know their patients really well and, and they feel like they're a very valued member of the team now because they're, I mean, they're with the patient throughout the entire visit. So they learn an incredible amount of medicine uh, doing that. And, um, but they're, you know, if they, if they know how to type and they enjoy the patient engagement and want to help the doctor, they'll, you know, they'll generally do quite well. Do you find that that staff person who has some initiative, who wants to be involved and wants to dive in, do you find that that person is typically stable in that job description or do they move up and out fairly regularly up to potentially nursing school or something like that? I think generally they are pretty stable in that job. You know, they, Peter had nurses that had been with him for a while, but then once they implemented it, they, this model, they stayed with them. I think they, they really enjoy it. And it actually has become a recruiting advantage for some of our customers over their competition because the word gets out that, you know, rather than just collecting a couple of vitals and then leaving the patient in the exam room and going back to your desk and not really having much to do, uh, especially in a primary care setting, you know, that's been one of the complaints for a long time with nurses is they don't like primary care because of you know, it's just not that challenging. Instead of that, they're now inside the exam room, they're helping the doctors, they're collecting all the patient's information, and uh, they're a much more integral part of the team. And um, so, yeah. Well, I think you're saying it's an recruitment advantage for the ancillary staff, but isn't it also an recruitment advantage for new physicians coming into that system? <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, and we, you know, we have, it's funny because we've had a few of the people that have come through as MAs and we go back or we hear later that, you know, they've learned so much and they've been so inspired uh, that they've gone on to get a nurse practitioner's, you know, job or, or something like that. So we've heard that several times. So again, the principle is one of the key causes of burnout in this modern day and age is task overwhelm, the whirlwind of task overwhelm in an office day. The origin story for this is the implementation of EMR and other digital workflows in the absence of enough hands on deck to take care of the, just the clicks and the keystrokes that need to be done. And so what we're doing is simply right-sizing the care team a team-based intervention to upstaff the back office to handle the digital workload. And you will be flying in the face of AMGA and MGMA staffing average studies that show just like before EMR, now with EMR, an outpatient doc only gets one MA. And that's woefully inadequate, as we all know, to deal with EMR itself. But then inbox, you, you already know you need an extra half person just to handle the inbox where it is associated with it. And now, how many, how many uh, uh, clients have you had over the years in your consulting work installing this? You said you had the Army. How many clients around uh, the country are, are working on what you have to teach? We've probably done about 70 different clients um, and hundreds of doctors within those walls. Some of them, uh, many of them have moved on. You know, we sometimes will uh, license them to train their own staff using our materials and so forth. But um, that's for people that have gone through a pilot and they really like it and they want to roll it out to their doctors. We've got several customers like that that are doing that. Well, you know, I said a, a moment ago, you need two and a half clinical assistants, but that's not the limitation. Uh, you know, go back to Peter. He, he had three and a half clinical assistants working with him and he was seeing 35 patients a day. So there's a roughly roughly a 10x multiple dike that you can put on it if you've got two and a half clinical assistants. Generally, a primary care doctor, we feel like should be able to see 25 patients a day pretty comfortably. If you've got three, you know, maybe 30, 35, or three and a half. So uh, really the sky's the limit. Peter, his upper range was 40. He had four clinical assistants working with him for a while, but, but that was a little too hot for him. So he backed down to, to 35. Uh, but that 10x multiple gives you a little bit of a sense of where it's possible. We had uh, one customer up in New England. The doctors were in their low 20s when we implemented. Uh, they never got their two and a half clinical assistants, but they did get to about 24, 25 patients a day. And they told the administration, tell me how many patients you need me to see in order to get the third, they wanted to get their third MA or their third team care assistants, what we call them, 
after they've been through our training. They wanted to get their third one. So they said, tell me how many patients I need to see in order to be able to hire that additional person. And they still never got a response. So that was kind of frustrating for them. Right. Well, it, it, it's frustrating because I would think from my experience working with C-suites and, and, and individual providers around the country, I would think that it is rare for an organization to launch a pilot project to test your uh, practice model, even though you've got 16 years with a history behind it. There is so much resistance to hiring an additional person. And now there's so much difficulty finding in a person to fill that that yeah. job description yeah. and now from the way you talk it sounds like when you do a consult you're training the doctors you're training the staff you're probably training the leadership you're bringing the whole capacity for this particular team care model with you when you come in as a consultant yes yeah we do we our goal is really to deliver a customized turnkey implementation of the team care model in your practice so that involves you know, clearly administration, we're involved with them, uh, setting up pay scales and, and you know, things like that, because uh, we, want, we want the teams to be incentivized properly and so forth. It involves the front office uh, scheduling people because they need to know what's happening back in the clinical area so that they can, you know, adjust their schedules. So we work on that with them, giving them scheduling templates and things like that, and communications to the patients when they come in on this new process that they're doing. Um, and then we do, uh, most of our work is with the provider and their clinical assistants. They go through our training and launch program. It's a, we, we spend about 10 or 12 weeks developing our curriculum and our customized training around their workflows and their EHR and how they're currently doing it. We merge in our process into that. Uh, we start the training with a couple of live Zoom sessions where we just basically set the foundational principles so that uh, when we're there on site, uh, we can focus on actually getting the team care model launched. The highlight of our training is the a two and a half day engagement with the customer where we come on site uh, with our, we have a lead training, a very professional trainer that works with us uh, that helps them train this model. If it's a five team pilot, for example, uh, we'll bring five coaches, one for each team, and they work with them during the three half-day classroom sessions that we have, um, where they're learning to work together in this fashion. They're learning to communicate together because, you know, doctors aren't used to having someone present a patient to them. Right. Certainly the MAs aren't used to presenting, uh, which is a little daunting for them at first, but they eventually they get very good at it. Um, but we, we train them and the coach is there to help them through these exercises in the classroom. But more importantly, the coach will actually go back with the team to the practice location and be inside the exam room with the newly minted team care assistant, helping them through the first few patient visits. Because it's, it's a little bit, like I said, it's a little bit uh, challenging, a little daunting, a little overwhelming for them. The coach is there to make sure things go relatively smoothly. And, you know, we're building their confidence and getting them better, you know, right off the bat. So having that at the elbow support has been, uh, we haven't changed the way we've trained our and launched teams in, in about eight years because it works so well having that coach right there. And when you say team, you, I believe you mean the doctor and the assistants that are with that individual doctor. Correct. So so and we want to, we train, actually, we train additional people if they're, you know, if they've got some floats or uh, PRN staff, then we want them to go through the training as well so that they can step in when people are out for sickness or maternity leave or what have you. Um, so it, it's very effective training and it works really, really well. And then say what you can about your experience of the the providers and the staff that speak to you before and after an implementation speak about their burnout before and after and their turnover before and after if, if you have that information well we have the um really the the stakeholders in the patient visit there's four one's administration you know that's pretty obvious 
uh, two is the patient, three is the staff member, and four is the provider. So in this model, really none of those people come away you know, with their heads hanging low and, and not getting something out of the model. The administration gets providers that are more productive and happier. Um, the clinical assistant staff, like I said, they, they really enjoy the patient engagement. And uh, they also very much enjoy feeling like they're a, a really valued member of the team now. If they don't show up or they don't do their job well, then things don't go well. And, and they really feel like they're a much more valued member of the team and they enjoy that. Uh, and they, like I said earlier, they learn an incredible amount of medicine. Um, the doctors, you know, oftentimes before we train and launch, you know, they're working a pretty long day, probably seeing anywhere from 17 to 21 or 22 patients on average. And then they're going home at night and spending a couple of hours at night trying to close charts. They're doing more time on the weekend, trying to get caught up from the previous week and get prepared for the next week. It's a pretty miserable life that many of them are leave, leading. And, you know, I'm sure they've got plenty of friends, but you know, they can't really complain too much because they're doctors, they're well paid generally. And you right. know, people, people just don't want to hear doctors complain. Right. So, um, so, but they, so we're able to make them, like I said before, anywhere from 20% to 40% more productive in visit volume. So they can see more patients. Um, they generally make more money because they're seeing more patients. They're getting more accomplished during a patient visit with their work RVUs going up. Um, but in many cases, we've been brought in Dyke, just to help give the doctors a sense of having a life outside of medicine again, because they're all, many of them are trapped in this, uh, I don't know, it's like a death cage almost, you know, <laughs> you go in and you battle with the EHR and you may, or you may not survive. Right. And, uh, and they're pretty miserable. And so, uh, we had one, one group in Cincinnati that we did in 2019, it was about five weeks after initial launch and there were uh, six doctors in the pilot and they were up an average of 35% in their daily visit volumes. But more importantly for them, we had reduced their after hours by about 80%. Right. On. That was the average. And uh, I mean, when you do something like that and you hear their responses, when you come back for follow-up visits and so forth to help them get fully implemented and things like that, it's, it's so inspiring. And it, it really, you know, Peter, he wasn't an inventor, but he stumbled onto this and they worked out the details and got it running really, really well. And honestly, you know, this really is the way you should practice medicine. Now, when you, if you're involved with patient visits and exam rooms, it works not only in primary care, but it works in specialists as well. We've done OBGYN, dermatology, orthopedics. Uh, it, it's effective in each of those. And you know, the responses are um, sometimes in the, in the class, when we're going through those first few exercises where the team care assistant is presenting the patient to the doctor for the first time or whatever, they get that aha moment. And it's so fun to see them realize, you can see their brain churning, like maybe this could really work, you know, and, and it does. And uh, having them feel that excitement and possibility that they can get control of this thing and, and get their life back is really, it's inspiring. Well, and that's one of the things we see all the time, because again, a lot of our work is with burned out doctors, is that the tipping point is when you lose faith that positive change is possible. And that's when we see people start to question their original decision to become a doctor in the first place. That's a tragic thwarting of the impulse to be a light worker, right? Yeah. So, so what I'll say is that um, this is also something that's, uh, that is um, to be contrasted with the efforts in the venture capital community to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to somehow avoid using human beings in the patient encounter. So this is a high touch, team-based, collaborative, supportive, human to human 
strategy to deal with the overwhelm of EHR documentation and inbox tasks that actually creates more income, more connection, lower turnover, lower burnout rates, gives you your life balance back. And I just want everybody to remember what he just said. In eight years, they haven't changed their, their consulting and training protocols because what they have right now is a box that is mature and works every time. So, and I also want to say that uh, team care medicine, like I said, they're the greatest of all time and the first in the niche of these team-based upstaffing projects. There are two other people that I know that are out there have replicated this work, but don't serve as consultants that I'm aware of. And I'm going to leave links down below. Belin Health, B-E-L-L-I-N Health has a fellow up there who I'm friend with, Jim Jerzat. And Jim is a family doc. And his quote, my favorite quote of Jim's is, everything gets so much easier if you can just keep the doctors out of the chart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that quote. And then another person who's done this and published on it recently is Corey Lyon, Dr. Corey Lyon at the University of Colorado. His program is called Apex, A-P-E-X. I've got a couple of references to Corey. Corey's piece of special sauce is that when he does one of these projects, it's very similar in structure, but he's developed what I call a set of CFO metrics. He's developed a set of metrics to measure the impact of his projects that speak directly to the amygdala of a CFO. I mean, he's talking, he's talking straight to the CFO when he's, man, when he's measuring what he man, measures. But again, if you want somebody to come in, train up four, five, six of your doctors in the process and their assistants, launch them with full on the elbow support. You're going to look at teamcaremedicine.com and Steve and his crew. Steve, any last words? I just get so excited whenever I talk about this because people have given up on doing anything about chart work and inbox work and, and pajama time and everything. But here you are. You've been doing this for a decade. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a couple of things I'd like to say. One is there's been a lot of emphasis in the last 10 years on team-based care. We hear that a lot. Almost all of that has been focused on helping the doctor outside the exam room by adding care coordinators or a pharmacist or behavioral health specialist. And in fact, that's just almost exasperating the problem for doctors because now they got more points of contact to deal with in the office and we are actually bringing resources into the exam room which is where the you know that's where the action is that's where the real interface with the ehr needs to occur and does occur and um you know dyke if i could take just a second and walk through what the the role of the team care assistant is if we got a second sure is that one um, of your slides it is okay I, let me let me pull it up for you is it this one? Yes. Okay, great. So in the team care medicine model, the objective is to offload from the provider all non-physician work during a patient visit. And so, like I said earlier, there's two and a half clinical assistants that are helping the physician. Two of them are devoted to the provider to help execute the patient visit. So what the team care assistant does, typically uh, they'll room the patient and they'll begin to set some uh, expectations, some boundaries around the, today's visit. If it's an urgent visit, the patient's coming in because they got a sore throat or they've twisted their knee, then the, the team care assistant's going to try to keep that as a one item urgent visit rather than turning it, letting it turn into a, a multi-chronic disease follow-up visit because they've got one of those scheduled in a couple of weeks. You know, can't we just knock that out today too, Doc? Um, so the team care assistant's there to try to help set some expectations. And then in step two, they go through their, this is the data collection part that Peter uh, taught his staff to do for him. They'll do a full med reconciliation. They'll do an allergy update, a family history update, social history update. They'll look at the last two plans of the provider and ask them, the patient, you know, how they're doing on what the provider had asked them to do and so forth. It's really a, it's building a 360 degree view of that patient for the provider. And the centerpiece of that is asking some questions about the chief complaint. And we have about 350 symptom disease question sets that we call them. And that's what guides the team care assistant to ask some of these questions about uh, 
what the patient's in for. So for example, if they're in for shoulder pain, all doctors are gonna ask basically the same eight or 10 questions about the shoulder pain. You know, when did it start? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Is the pain mild, moderate, severe? Does it radiate down your arm? You know, what brings it on? Does anything help it? Those type of questions are in these question sets. So the team care assistant asks the question of the patient and then records the answer right in the chart of the patient. And once they've completed their 15 steps of data collection, then they'll notify the, the physician or the provider and the provider will come in the exam room. They'll present the patient to the doctor and that's very patient satisfying because now the patient gets to hear their story repeated and they know at that point that they've been heard and understood. And they can, of course, they can add or adjust or change anything as the uh, presentation is going on. But at the end of the presentation, then the doctor has the responsibility to confirm and complete the information fill in any blanks that they may have to do, you know, to move on to their diagnosis and so forth. So once the presentation is complete, now the team care assistant really becomes a scribe for the, for the visit and they will, uh, they'll document any physical exam findings. They'll document the physician's diagnosis and the treatment plan, any orders that the provider has, uh, labs that need to be done or scans that need to be done, et cetera. And they'll pin those orders. And the provider, you know, they, they just get their verbal update, they go into their medical thinking and decision making, and uh, they make their diagnosis, they explain it to the patient, they do their treatment plan, explain that to the patient, and then the provider leaves at the end of step four. And then the team care assistant is left in the room with the patient, and uh, they'll go over the plan one more time with the provider. They'll uh, execute on the orders that the physician has. Uh, if they need to be signed, they might step out for a moment, get the physician to sign the orders, and then come back. And they'll finish the visit, finish the chart, and walk the patient out. And the goal is to have the chart completely done by the end of that patient visit before the nice. team care assistant goes to get the next patient. Now, the doctor will have to take another final look at it to make sure everything is is good and, and accurate according to what they recalled and so forth. And we have a couple of safety net communication pieces where the doctor is jotting down some of the orders and so forth to make sure things get in the chart properly. But at the end of the morning or the end of the day, we want the doctors to just do their final review of the chart and then be able to go home at night uh, with not much to do but enjoy their family time. We really push that. So the team care assistant, that's the way the the team care assistant helps the physician in the exam room. And then, I don't know, Dyke, if you could throw up the next slide, if you have it. Uh, yeah, this, there's the workflow. This is how the, the team care model op operates um, in, in the office. So while team care assistant one is in exam room one with patient one, and uh, maybe the doctor's in there now with them doing their thing, team care assistant two has got patient two in exam room number two, and they're, they're going through their data collection. And so the, you know, the, the flow is the doctor, like I said a moment ago, they go in, they get the verbal presentation, they ask any other additional information they need to do their physical exam, they make their diagnosis, their decision, uh, their treatment plan. They do what they went to medical school to do, right they're off the computer, uh, completely, unless they're looking at a lab report or something like that, but they're, they're able to focus solely on the patient, and that leads to much better care, and the patients also appreciate the fact that the doctors are, are looking at them now and talking to them face-to-face -face versus being, you know, buried in the, in the chart while they're trying to update right. that. So, uh, these are overlapping appointments. It's usually about 15 minutes of the doctor's time, 30 minutes in, in clock time, but 45 minutes in total clinical time because you get 30 minutes with the team care assistant plus 15 minutes with uh, the physician. So the patients, they don't feel like they get cheated out of time um, because they love that focused attention. And it leads to better care because the doctors are really able to relax and think about what they want to do with this patient to help them feel better. We had one doctor in that Cincinnati pilot 
he, his comment was, I never knew how stressful it was to carry on two conversations at once. You know, one with the patient as they're doing their interviewing and talking with the patient, but as the other one was trying to key as much of that information into the computer as they're doing it. Right. And they, they didn't realize how stressful it was until they didn't have to do it anymore. So right. this, is, this is the flow of the, of the visit throughout the day. Nice. Yep, makes total sense. Makes total sense, and it it just it just flabbergasts me that this is not the standard operating procedure of outpatient practices across the United States. High touch doctor working at the top of their license. It's always easy to walk into an office and see a doctor who's not working to the top of their license. They're either touching a keyboard or a mouse, and they shouldn't be doing either one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there was a study done. I don't remember who did it or what, but I do remember the stat. It was like 60 or 70% of the work that physicians do during a patient visit is non-physician work. Right. And you know, you explain that to a CFO and you know, tell them you can stop their doctors from doing that non-physician work and they can see more patients and get more done. You know, it's it's a logical concept and and they get well. And I think that the challenge is that if you are, and, and again, I'll express what I believe is number one, my bias, but it's also true. Most physician employees now work in systems where the core business was originally a hospital. Mm -hmm. And a hospital doesn't know how to make more income by increasing services or volumes. A hospital is specialized in cutting costs. And for a CFO that is steeped in that hospital tea, um, they would be very hesitant to upstaff the back office in pursuit of higher levels of profit. They're very comfortable though, cutting the physician down to absolute minimum. Yeah. And as long as the doctors continue to show up and see the patients, they're satisfied that they're running a tight ship. And what they're doing is like you said, a, a, what was it, a cage match? chained in the wrestling tag team cage match, battling the EMR every day. And the other thing that I'll tell you, and I know this for true, because I've asked the questions before, a CFO shadowing a primary care doc in an outpatient clinic, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. They don't understand how the sausage is made and they think their spreadsheets represent the totality of a physician's experience. And it's tragic, it's a tragic missed opportunity. Um, let me ask you this. In these last six months, have you met additional resistance or di additional difficulty finding the people who will be your team care assistants? Uh, definitely. Yeah, it, it, there is a shortage across the country of trained clinical medical assistants or CMAs. And uh, that, you know, that we're definitely feeling that as well. But the, the nice thing about the way we do our engagements is you know, if you sign a contract with us, we don't come next week and deliver. Uh, we come out and we spend, uh, we come out and spend a few days with you right off the bat. And we begin to learn your processes, the people and how they're working together and communicating currently and so forth. But then we, we go back and then over the series of a couple of months, we're working with you all developing our curriculum and our training and launch tools and so forth. So that gives time for them to recruit and find the staff. And then of course, if if they're not ready when we're ready, then we just hold off on the training and launch until they're all set to go. And this model, you know, it fits really well in the fee for service, but it also works just great in a capitated environment. Um, right. If you want to maximize the health of your patient, keep them out of the emergency rooms and the urgent care centers, you know, access is key to that. And um, having your providers or, or physicians be able to focus only on the patient that leads to better care and the improved access, you know, leads to lower cost overall. So it works in either one of the primary um, payment models that are out today. Yeah, it allows you to take a larger panel size, right? And then I was also noticing when you said that um, one of the things the team care assistant does is help set patient expectations, especially on acute visit. You know, it's a heck of a lot easier to convince somebody to not deal with a chronic issue if you know you've got openings in your schedule as well. And that's always based on, on your ability to handle volume as well. Yeah. Yep. Wow. 
So this has been awesome. Thank you so very much. Um, that has been Steve Moberg, COO of Team caremedicine.com. There's no dots or dashes there. Teamcaremedicine.com. They are the greatest of all time, the first in the niche. And he's just told you a little bit about comprehensive their support service is. Launch five or six doctors and their teams at once and train you how to spread it within the organization. Magnificent stuff. And what it proves is that, what it proves is that burnout and digital overload are things that are hardwired into the structure of the average practice in the United States. And it doesn't have to be that way. Right. If we could just fight this tendency to cut costs rather than give the physicians the support they need to practice at the top of their license. Any last words, Steve? Uh, no, not really. I, mean, I appreciate the opportunity talking with you, Dyke. It's been really good, really fun. Right on. And remind us where you're physically located. Uh, I'm in Yorktown, Virginia. And that's where, right on. That's where Dr. Anderson lived, and um, and uh, so we're we're out of Virginia, but we've trained, you know, all the way. We we launched uh, doctors out in Hawaii, actually. So we've oh, all right on. We've been all over the country, and uh, we're very good at what we do, helping teams get up and running. You know, trying to uh, one last thought. I will give you one last thought, Peter. Okay. When he wrote his handbook, and he was uh, he actually did a video series on it too. He was selling those and selling them quite a bit. And, um, but he started finding out that doctors were having a real difficult time implementing it. And um, the problem was, it was sort of like throwing a book on how to swim to someone who's drowning. Right. So it, <laughs> they're not gonna be able to flip through the pages and, and try to do it themselves quickly. So that, that was really the impetus. When, when the army contract came in, that's when we realized we got to come up with a different way of training and launching and helping these teams. And so if you're drowning, you need someone to jump in and, and save you and help you. Right. And right. so that's why we take all the implementation burden really away from the, the administration and the doctors. We, we coordinate and work through all that ourselves uh, with them, but we do the bulk of the work. And, um, you know, that's how we got into that sort of training method. So it's, it's very effective and, yeah, I appreciate the time. Thank you. Makes total sense. Makes total sense. I haven't got the bandwidth. I haven't got the strength or the endurance to do a 180 in my practice model if I'm if I'm just barely keeping my lips above the surface of the water doing what I'm doing right now. That's right. Right on. Thank you so much for being here. And this is Dyke Drummond at the home of the Happy MD in beautiful Seattle, Washington, today with Steve Moberg at Team Care Medicine. If this excites you the way it excites me and you'd like to have a conversation about what the model would look like in your institution, give them a call, connect with them at teamcaremedicine.com, teamcaremedicine.com, and then be on the lookout for our new Burnout Proof MD three-layer physician support ecosystem. Our next webinar is within a couple of weeks whenever you're listening to this broadcast. That's it for today. Keep breathing and have a great rest of your day. I'll see you on the next Physicians on Purpose podcast. Thanks, Steve.